So I'd just like us to take a moment, please, and have people from the Canadian Human Rights Commission identify themselves. My name is um, Carrie Buck. I'm the Director of Policy and International Programs at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And before I pass the mic to my colleague here, uh, Sherry Helgeson, who's the Director of Investigations, was meant to be here today, but she sends her apologies. She's home with the flu, um, but we'll be reporting back, and the 28 pages of notes I take today will be passed on to her as well. Hi, I'm Maureen Armstrong. I'm the Acting Manager of Legal Services Branch at the Commission. Donna Duvall, I'm from the policy branch. Okay, is that, uh, that's everybody from the Commission. Very good. I'm just wondering if those from uh, uh, Correction Services Canada, please, if they would mind uh, introducing themselves as well. Hi, I'm Christy Squires. I'm from the Women Offender Sector at CSC. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Um, We'll, we'll carry on, and the next um, presentation is from the Disabled Women's Network, Dawn of Canada. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Yvonne Peters. I hope you, you all had a good lunch and that you followed it up with aerobics <laughs> so that you're wide awake and, uh, and ready and passionate to hear more information. Before I get started, I'd like to just introduce my colleagues. To my right is Barbara Anello, who is with Dawn Ontario. And to her right is Kathy Marshall, who is the Executive Director of Dawn Canada. And to my left is Bobby Livingston. And I'm going to turn it over to her just for a moment uh, for her to give you some idea of who Dawn is, and then we'll get on with the main presentation. Thank you, Yvonne. Dawn Canada is a national feminist organization founded in 1985 and comprised of a board of directors and membership that spans across the country. We are a consumer-controlled advocacy network with representation of provincial affiliates serving on our national board of directors. Our organization has a number of committees, namely the Equality Rights Committee, Technology Committee, and the Women's Alliance Committee. We are controlled by women with disabilities working to achieve control over our own lives and end the stereotypes that label us as burdens on society. We are a member of the Council of Canadians with Disabilities and have strong alliances with organizations such as the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies and the National Association of Women in the Law. Dawn Canada has a rich history of research initiatives to fulfill our mission to end the poverty, isolation, discrimination, and violence experienced by women with disabilities, including Aboriginal women, Black women, Asian women, South Asian women, women of colour, immigrant women, lesbians, older women, women in institutions, and single mothers. A sample of our research includes litigation consultations, mandatory minimum sentencing, new reproductive genetic technologies, community-based access to technology for women with disabilities, accessibility to transition shelters for women with disabilities, the duty to accommodate, violence and abuse of women with disabilities. Thanks very much, um, Bobby. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, my, as I said, my name is Yvonne Peters, and I had the privilege of working with Dawn Canada to prepare our submission. We do have a written submission, and uh, I'm sure that it, it will eventually, once it's finalized, be circulated to anybody who's interested, but certainly to the Canadian Human Rights Commission. We entitled our paper... Uh, federally sentenced women with mental disabilities, a dark corner in Canada's history. And the reason for that title uh, stems, I guess, from the fact that uh, although people with disabilities in Canada and women with disabilities in particular have a long way to go in terms of reclaiming our rights, uh, we have made some progress. Unfortunately, though, when we look at federally sentenced women with mental disabilities, we can see that they are very much 
behind the progress, and that progress has not translated itself into the prison system. Um, this afternoon, our submission will be provided in four parts. I'll begin by just giving you a bit of a contextual overview of the evolution of disability policy in Canada. And I do that because I think it's very important to situate the analysis of the experience of women with mental disabilities in prison from a rights-based approach. I think there's a great temptation to look at mental disability primarily as a medical issue, but we want to situate it within a rights framework. So I'll start with a bit of a very brief policy overview. Um, we'll then look at some of the circumstances, not all of them, there are many, we don't have time to do them all today, but I will um, briefly cover some of the main conditions within the prison system that we believe contribute to a discriminatory environment. I'll then move on and summarize uh, our recommendations and the rationale for those recommendations. Um, I'd like to then touch on why we think the Canadian Human Rights Act is applicable and why the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, particularly Section 15, is applicable, and hopefully with, uh, leave you with some thoughts on the consultation paper recently distributed by the Canadian Human Rights Commission. So beginning then in terms of looking at the evolution of policy in Canada, uh, in Canada prior to 1960, social policy pertaining to disability was based on an ethic of care and protection. <coughs> Many people with disabilities were classed as patients, and forced to reside in institutions. It was assumed that they were permanently inca incapacitated and therefore incompetent and, of course, in need of care. Um, institutionalization isolated people from, with disabilities from community. Segregation um, emphasized that disability was different and lack of public awareness regarding the needs and interests of persons with disabilities um, engendered myths and stereotypes about what it meant to have to, to, to live with a life with a disability. Over time, social policy evolved and persons with disabilities were moved from medical institutions and facilities back into the community. However, even though they were in the community, persons with disabilities continued to experience isolation and exclusion from mainstream society. And this was mainly because Persons with disabilities were, were still really relegated to the margins of society, and societal norms really only reflected characteristics that would be associated with able-bodiedness. So, for example, the whole accessibility struggle took place because the built environment was really only structured for able-bodied persons, and um, still is to a large extent, uh, rather than looking taking into account a broad range of uh, mobility methods that people may use. Um, during the last couple of decades, however, throughout the world, there has really been a dramatic shift um, from paternalistic approaches to disability to the recognition of, of rights. Um, <clears throat> Canadians with disabilities now enjoy both constitutional, constitutional and statutory protection of their human rights. Um, and under a human rights framework, the focus has shifted from trying to, as we say, fix the individual, um, associating the problems that a person with a disability experiences with the individual, to evaluating how various social and economic processes in our society can pose barriers, s systemic barriers, and how we need to reconfigure them to be more accommodating and to enhance equality for people with disabilities. So the institutional warehousing of persons with mental disabilities is really no longer an acceptable practice. Um, the recognition that people can and do benefit from community services has rendered the likelihood of institutionalization really um, a, a, an undesirable and, and a remote kind of possibility. Um, moreover, institutions have been replaced when it comes to persons with disabilities by uh, various um, types of drugs which can offer perhaps a more humane alternative to long-term care hospitalization. Um, despite the progress that has been made for persons with disabilities, what we are finding with um, persons with mental disabilities is an increasing tendency to, uh, de to criminal criminalize the behavior of persons with mental disabilities. 
Um, when people were deinstitutionalized, um, it was seen as a very good thing. However, I think we can we, we all recall a lot of debate that went on about the real lack of community supports that were available to people with disabilities to live independently in the community. And for persons with, mis with mental disabilities, this has really escalated over the last little while um, due to cutbacks to health and social programs, um, the very little services that were available to persons with mental disabilities are really almost non-existent. And so what happens, as you, um, you can understand, is when homelessness becomes a problem, um, when unemployment becomes a problem, when, with lack of appropriate health care, um, things can go wrong. And that happens um, more often than not to women with mental disabilities who, because of their disability, because of their lack of access to services, because of their, the lack of access to support, find themselves, um, well, as Kim says, finds the law coming into conflict with their lives. And um, they end up, uh, of course, then in the either the provincial or federal um, corrections institution. Um, in some ways, then, uh, well, well, certainly if you look at uh, the trends in, in, in the American trends, they have noted a, a huge escalation of persons with mental disabilities um, being sentenced into uh, penal institutions. Uh, that is also happening here in Canada, and it is certainly happening with for women with mental disabilities. So advocates are now saying, you know, is the clock being turned back? Um, have we found another form of institutionalization? Have we, are we now looking to the prisons as an institution or as a resource of, of, of last resort because we don't have the community services that are needed to enable uh, women to live independently and with dignity in the community? So we're very concerned about the uh, over-criminalization of women with mental disabilities who end up in prison because of behavior or circumstances that are associated with their mental disability. Now, I... I I have to say that when we were doing our research, uh, we read a lot of documents put out by the Canadian government and by the um, CSC, and it was there's a lot of uh, or there's a lot of reference to women with mental disabilities. What's not as clear is who exactly we're talking about. Um, I don't find the statistics that other groups are able to quote in terms of what percentage of the of federally sentenced women have a mental disability. It may very well exist, but it's not easily identifiable. Um, I have some concern about whether or not we want to pursue uh, finding out just exactly um, what, who per women with mental disabilities are and what, their, what the statistical representation is. And the reason I have con we have concern is that there is a tendency, um, and it's, you know, a leftover from our, our uh, not-too-distant history of pathologizing disability. There is a tendency to pathologize, individual, to pathologize those situations that are really more um, barriers in society and discrimination um, that constituted through our society. There's a tendency to pathologize those as individual problems. So I, I don't want to encourage us to start labeling everybody with a mental disability who experiences barriers or discrimination or um, poverty or uh, difficulties in, in terms of societal institutional issues. Um, I also worry that given uh, our understanding of the current prison environment that um, being labeled a person with a mental disability may also uh, then make you more vulnerable to more risk management and higher security levels. So I have some concern about trying to pursue exactly who out there, who within the federal prison system has a mental disability. At the same time, though, I think if we want to really understand how this problem is escalating and how women with mental disabilities are being criminalized and sent to prison as a way of dealing with their issues, we do need to have a much clearer handle on who those women are and what the issues are that they are experiencing and what their needs are. We use the term mental disability um, quite broadly in our paper to refer to um, women who are experiencing psychiatric issues, women with cognitive disabilities, women who experience difficulties with addictions, developmental problems. So we take a very broad view, and I think this parallels um, how human rights 
legislation have defined mental disability. Um, so I'd like to now turn to the second part of our presentation and identify those circumstances that we think constitute um, discrimination against women with mental disabilities. Our pivotal concern is that um, providing an effective, appropriate healing environment within a prison system, within a penal system, is next to impossible. Um, and and our, our concern is that, well, as, you, as we will demonstrate, that there really are The um, Corrections Conditional Re Release Act, I'll just say CCRA, um, says that one of the purposes of the correctional system is to provide rehabilitation services to prisoners so that they can integrate uh, back into the community as law-abiding citizens. This section is immediately followed up by Section 4, which sets out the principles that must guide the, this purpose or the purposes of the correction system. And one of those principles is that at all times the safety and protection of the public be seen as a paramount consideration. Now, of course, we don't have difficulty with that principle per se, but when it comes to um, women with mental disabilities receiving rehabilitation services within a prison environment, we think that problems are created by that principle because inevitably um, what, what takes precedent is the need to ensure security. So security becomes the overriding interest um, when it comes to providing services and when it comes to providing support to women with mental disabilities. And we need to only look at the Act or the regulations to the Act to see how that is borne out. And you've heard a little bit about this this morning, but let me reiterate for you. Section 30 of the Act requires um, prisoners to be uh, classed in a, in a, to be designated as a particular security level, minimum, medium, and maximum. To assist with this process, Section 17 of the regulations sets out some of the risk factors that should be taken into account when determining what level of security a prisoner should be assigned to. Well, Clause E of Section 17 boldly identifies physical or mental disorder suffered by an inmate as a risk factor. Uh, this, we would submit, is blatantly discriminatory. Um, true, what correction system is trying to do is identify um, the types of behavior and conduct that may be a, a management problem uh, so that they, the person can be properly placed within the security system. But the fact that physical and mental disability is squarely identified as a risk factor really harkens back to the old days when we associated mental disability with dangerousness, with the need for control, with the need for um, ongoing invasive supervision. I think, and if you look at the criteria, I won't go through them now, but there are enough factors there that help to identify the conduct and the behavior of the inmate without having to identify physical or mental disability as a specific factor. It, it just, as I have to reiterate, really um, advocates and promotes old discriminatory myths and stereotypes about people with disabilities. So that's blatant discrimination. Adverse effect discrimination then occurs um, further when you look at some of the assessment tools that are used to, to get to, to go even deeper in terms of figuring out whether a person, where a person should be placed in the security levels. And again, you've heard some of this this morning, but issues such as um, attachment to family, employment history, educational level, um, ability to socialize, addictions, um, willingness to, uh, you know, opportunities and abilities to live independently, all of those criteria are also assessed 
And if you don't score well on those criteria, that can be held against you and considered to be uh, something that needs to be considered in terms of the security level. Well, for many uh, women with mental disabilities, because they don't have the supports that they need, because we have a society that tends to relegate them to the margins of society, encounter many of those problems, encounter homelessness, encounter, un encounter unemployment because of, of employers who don't understand and discriminate against people with mental disabilities, encounter difficulties with family because of their problems, encounter difficulties with addictions and so on. So not only are women with mental disabilities um, bluntly or blatantly identified as a risk problem, then all of the factors associated with their disability is also held against them. And so we have adverse effect discrimination. Well, as we've already heard, many women with mental disabilities find themselves in maximum security. I'd sure like to know exactly how many, but I, I know that uh, CSC has said uh, they're overrepresented in maximum security, and, and I believe that. Um, the for women generally in the population, the rate of mental disability is 6.7, according to Stats Canada. Um, and as we've heard, as we've read, uh, that's much higher in the, uh, in the prison environment. Well, maximum security also brings with it, and we've heard a bit today, but bear with me to let me repeat, um, lots of, of problems and creates um, many discriminatory situations for women with mental disabilities. Um, first of all, their location, and we know that that's going to change, but I, I think maximum security is maximum security. It doesn't matter where you locate it. Maximum security implies restricted movement. It um, implies um, limited opportunities um, to uh, obtain employment skills, to obtain an education. In some cases, we know that uh, there's such limited space that there isn't even an opportunity for confidential counseling. So the women with disabilities, the very women who need um, the most support by being placed in maximum security are really deprived of the many supports and services that they need in order to, to, uh, to undergo the rehabilitation required of them by the Act. Um, maximum security, as I said, you know, implies lots of rules, and, and I suppose that's part of the system. If you're, you're going to um, be concerned with security, the way you do that is you have to establish lots of rules. Well, following rules can be a very difficult process for many uh, people, women with uh, mental disabilities. For example, it may be very difficult for them to stand in a lineup. I, gee, I was just downstairs after lunch standing in a lineup, and I was frustrated. If I had to do it every day, I'm sure... Uh, disability or not, it would be a very difficult process to go through. And it's particularly difficult, as I say, for, for women with mental disabilities. Well, they may express their frustration um, through behavior that is seen as acting out. And when that happens, um, a number of actions are triggered. First of all, we may have a staff, we frequently have a staff, who again um, has these many different roles to play. We have a staff that is probably told over and over again, your job is to maintain security. And hopefully they have some training on how to deal with uh, women prisoners with mental disabilities. But I would um, imagine that most of their training is on security. So when this happens, when, so, when a woman expresses her frustration, acts out, the next step then is to remove her further from the population by placing her in, in an isolated environment. So the risk of being placed in an isolated in administrative segregation, as they say, is very high. Um, well, it's hard to imagine how when you already have a mental disability, you're already in an institution which is furthering a disadvantage and no doubt aggravating um, your, your disability. It's hard to imagine how being placed in isolation for days on end without access to too many services how that will help you rehabilitate yourself. Um, we can only imagine that, in fact, it escalates the mental disability. And, in fact, CAFES um, has firsthand experience with this situation, probably in numerous cases, but one case in particular where a woman was held in isolation. She, for um, reasons I won't go into at the moment, 
was sent out to a psychiatric facility outside the prison system for an assessment. Uh, when she arrived at the psychiatric facility in the community, she was inarticulate, unable to comprehend any sort of concepts, had a very difficult time having any kind of a conversation with anyone. Within a few short days, um, because she was able to talk with roommates, with able, was able to talk to psychiatrists, was able to communicate with her family, she was once again coherent, was able to articulate herself, express herself, and, uh, and was actually, uh, where she, when she came in, was deemed incompetent and within a few short days was deemed competent. Well, why was that? Well, she had human contact. She was able to, to, to be with people. So isolating people at the best of times simply has to be a brutal and barbaric uh, method of handling um, situations. In this day and age, there's got to be a better way. But it's particularly brutal, particularly um, horrific for people who, for women who already have um, a disability. Um, so there are many problems with, with, um, with being placed in maximum security. Um, the other issue is, is access to quality mental health care. And we know that CSC has, um, with the best of intentions, I would, would, would imagine, um, tried to institute a variety of initiatives to assist women with mental disabilities. But if you look at the... Um, I believe it's the 2002 Correctional Investigator Report, you will find um, the, a, a report on a woman who, was, who had a mental disability, who was in maximum security, who was isolated, who ended up dying because she could not, she did not have access to good quality mental health care. And um, as you'll hear me say over and over again, it's very difficult within a penal environment to provide health care, mental health care that is totally focused on the well-being of that woman because they have the overriding concern of security um, being the predominant interest. Um, and I, as I said earlier, I, I understand that within uh, the near future, uh, maximum security um, facilities will be moved out of um, the male prisons and into the regional women's facilities but as I say, I don't think it matters where you locate maximum security. It still comes, uh, the baggage and all of the difficulties that are intrinsic to maximum security still are still there and will still be a huge barrier for women with mental disabilities. Um, other forms of discrimination, um, not all women with mental disabilities land up in uh, maximum security. There are uh, intensive healing programs uh, in mi minima, minimum and medium security facilities. Um, but there's a problem with that too, in that um, if you're in the community and you have a mental health problem, you can be voluntarily or involuntarily committed. If you're voluntarily, if you go voluntarily, then obviously you're making choices. You're there because you want to be. If you're involuntarily committed, then there are very strict statutory requirements that come to bear on how you are held, how long you can be held, and what happens while you are being held. This is not the case as we understand it in the uh, prison environment. Um, yes, the CCRA says that um, informed consent must be given by the woman prisoner before she in order for her to participate in in a mental health program, but the reality is um, that in many cases she feels coerced because she knows that if she says no, the options will be maximum security or um, being sent off to the regional psychiatric center. So in a way, yes, she may give conform informed consent, but I, we would argue that it's really coerced informed consent. Um, and then again, once she's in this program, uh, the, the, the rules that would apply if you were in the community are very vague and elusive. Um, I think that the rules do apply in terms of, of um, involuntary committal, in terms of getting the woman into the program. But once she's in the program, there is no way for her to say, I've had enough. I don't want to be here anymore. This isn't working for me. Um, in the community, after the committal period is over, the woman can walk away and, and try another option. That option is not available to, to women uh, who are in the prison system. 
Um, other problems. Um, because, as I said earlier, women with mental disabilities have difficulty in an institutional environment. They um, find themselves in difficulty, in conflict with, or the rules conflict with their ability to cope. So, in fact, they end up with more charges um, against them, and so their time in prison um, gets extended. And it, it gets extended because, of course, they're seen as having a behavior problem, and it gets extended because they haven't yet been rehabilitated. We would argue that those problems that, um, stem from the fact that they have a disability which is not being properly accommodated, which is not being given the supports and services that the women require in order to be rehabilitated. So they're, dis they're disadvantaged again because they do not have the proper opportunities for rehabilitation. When you have a mental disability, we understand that the scrutiny level is very high. And we all, from time to time, I think somebody said, you know, today when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, when you're in prison, you need to be really careful because if you happen to say, you know, I feel really angry today, uh, or perhaps other things, uh, that can be held against you. And if you have a mental disability, it may be a good reason to, to isolate you, to move you out of the general population because you're seen as a threat to yourself and to others. So uh, the, the standard, the bar, is extremely high. Um, and again, I have to reiterate, uh, women with mental disabilities are already coping with so much, and then to have to be 100% perfect in order to be left alone is just an inordinate um, standard to be held to. Um, well, I guess just to conclude this part, uh, we feel very strongly, just to reiterate, that, that providing um, support and services to, to women with mental disabilities within a prison environment uh, in a way that will be successful and meaningful to her is, is impossible because no matter how you how you cast it, and, and many attempts have been made, there's many initiatives out there that CSC has tried to institute, but no matter how you frame it, no matter how you cast it, it has to be done inside of the context of security. And in some cases, the need for mental health care and the, the kinds of supports and understanding that a woman may need may collide with the security objective, and it's, not, it's, it's very difficult to reconcile those two, those two interests. Well, all right then, moving on to our recommendations. Um, we have three very basic recommendations. Uh, recommendation number one is that we need to explore other options other than incarcerating women with mental disabilities. We need to find ways to get them the support and help they need without uh, relegating them to an, uh, a draconian institution that really is ill-equipped and, and lacks the services necessary to assist women with mental disabilities to heal and to function in the community. Now, this isn't a new or novel idea. You've heard, of course, you've heard CAFE say this for a long time, but they're not the only ones saying this. Um, American courts are now looking at this issue because, because they are, are recognizing the problem of criminalizing uh, persons with mental disabilities. They recognize that something else has to be done. And what they've started to institute I'm not sure I like the name, but anyway, the concept is maybe an interesting one. They've started to institute mental health courts so that if somebody is in the um, criminal system because of an issue that can be identified as part of the uh, men mental disability syndrome, they go to these courts. And what the judge tries to do is to look at how this person can get support and assistance within the community without having been sent into an institutional environment. Now, of course, they too have to keep in mind the safety of the public. Um, I mean, that's a reality. But they also are trained um, and have, lo have uh, resources at their disposal to determine how best this person can be helped before they're just sent off without any consideration of whether or not a penal environment is where they ought to go. So that's uh, something that I think we really need to explore. Our concern is, of course, that that won't happen today or tomorrow. We'd like it. We, we wish you could do it, but, but if you can't, then what we would say is let's look at alternatives in terms of providing supports and services to women with mental disabilities um, 
if they're in prison, is there some way that they can have access to community services? Services that are mental health focused, women focused, and community based, where those services do not have to concern themselves so much with the security interests of the institution, but can concern themselves with the individual needs of, of the woman. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's possible. I think that, uh, in fact, that's already starting to happen to a certain degree, I understand, in Quebec. Um, some women have been transferred to a psychiatric facility from a prison system. Now, I'd want to be, again, cautious about that because we don't want to reinvent the psychiatric hospitals that uh, we got rid of in the, in the uh, 60s and 70s. But I think, I understand that the women are doing quite well in this environment, so I think it speaks to the idea that it is possible to set up alternative environments where women can go and heal and get the support they need other than being in a, in a penal institution. So I think even if women are incarcerated, they need to have access to services, mental health services outside of the prison system. And again, this isn't so far flung. We are seeing internationally that there is support for people with disabilities receiving community uh, support, community services and being integrated into the community. In 1991, the United Nations adopted the principles for the protection of persons with mental illness. Um, it's a non-binding uh, resolution, but it does set out a number of principles that countries, that states should take into account when they're dealing with people with mental disabilities. It does apply to uh, persons who are incarcerated. And one of the principles specifically says that where possible, uh, people with mental disabilities should receive supports and services in their local community, close to their family, um, in, the, in the least restrictive um, environment. So I think that's an important um, idea. And I think these principles are receiving wide recognition throughout the world. In addition, um, we have the standard rules on equal opportunity for persons with disabilities adopted by the United Nations in 1994. And again, this, this, uh, it's non-binding, but this document has received very uh, wide acceptance throughout the world. This rule three talks specifically about rehabilitation and the elements that should be considered uh, when, when looking at rehabilitation and remembering that part of the reason that Women who are incarcerated with mental disabilities, part of what they're supposed to be able to access in prison is rehabilitation services. So this is relevant. And section or Rule 3 says, again, that where possible, as much as possible, actually, it says, um, persons with disabilities should receive services in their home community, uh, uh, close to their families. Um, in 1994, um, the Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights um, pronounced comment number five, and I think another comment, comment number 14, which interprets the covenant on economic and social and cultural rights. And these comments deal specifically with the rights of persons with disabilities, and they adopt the, um, the um, principles on mental illness and the standard rules. And they also, comment number 14 speaks specifically to the right of persons with mental disabilities to have access to the supports and services they need to be able to live with dignity and independence in the community. I just point out these international um, standards because I think more and more they are becoming a part of how we think about human rights in Canada. So there's, there's ample evidence out there that says community is the best uh, place for people with mental disabilities to, to receive support and to heal. Uh, another case that's, that's interesting that I'd like to talk about, it's, it's not a Canadian case, it's an American case. It was, most, it was, it was decided uh, just a few years ago. It's the case of Olmstead. And this case uh, was taken under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And essentially what that ca case stands for is that if people with mental disabilities are improperly um, held in institutions, this can be seen as discriminatory and was found to be in contravention of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, that doesn't really apply to us in Canada, but I think it shows the thinking that is going on out there about institutions. Now, you might be saying, so like, well, so how does that apply to federally sentenced women with mental disabilities? I mean, after all, they committed a crime, so maybe they are properly um, institutionalized. But if you go back to what I said earlier, that in many cases, 
women with mental disabilities uh, be, um, find themselves labeled as criminals because of their mental disability. So if you look at it simply through the mental disability lens, then I think you could, you could muster an argument that says that they are improperly um, institutionalized in a prison system, especially when the supports and services they, are, they need are inadequate. So I think there's a growing body of, of legal evidence and standards out there that says to us, we really do have to take stock and we really do have to pay attention and we do have to start looking at this issue from a rights perspective. Our, our third recommendation is pretty straightforward and that is um, we do have to get rid of the blatantly discriminatory um, uh, legislative provisions such as uh, Clause E of Section 17 of the regulations. We also have to look closely at the factors that are considered in terms of, of um, how they impact on w women with mental disabilities. Uh, so those are our three recommendations, and the discussion is spelled out more, more in more detail in our paper, and I hope you will be able to read that someday soon. I just want to conclude by, by just talking about the relevance of, of the Charter and, and uh, the Canadian Human Rights Act. Section 15, as we know of the Charter, guarantees equality to all Canadians. And um, in a case about 10 years ago or so, Swain versus Canada, uh, which involved uh, a man with a mental disability who was subject to a lieutenant governor's warrant, what's important about that case is the court, the Supreme Court recognized that people with mental disabilities in Canada are a historically disadvantaged group. So they clearly are covered by Section 15 because the purpose of Section 15 is to ameliorate historical disadvantage and to promote equality. So we know that they're historically disadvantaged. I think, um, and as I've tried to convey to you today, that there, are, there is ample evidence that says that women with mental disabilities are being further disadvantaged by being incarcerated. So I do think that Section 15 is relevant, and I do think we have to pay attention to what the goals of that guarantee are all about. And I know there's, uh, from a legal perspective, a tendency to say, well, disadvantage compared to whom? Um, my uh, colleagues from LEAF will talk about, you know, the usefulness of comparing uh, and whether or not that's even important. But I think it's safe to say that, you know, generally people with mental disabilities are disadvantaged. So trying to compare uh, women in prison with women out of prison, I don't think gets us very far down the equality road. With respect to the Canadian Human Rights Act, um, I, again, I would argue that, uh, that there is prima facie discrimination, both in terms of blatant forms of discrimination and adverse effect discrimination. Um, I understand that under the Act that once that claim is made out, then the onus shifts to the respondent, which would be the Canadian government in this case and the CSC. I expect that what they will argue is that, wait a minute, um, we're not discriminating. Look at all the steps we've taken. And they will have lots of programs that they will be able to identify and strategies and committees and task forces and resources. But as I said earlier, I, I think that you know we need to look at what the real impact, not just not look at it from the medical perspective, but how has this how do these programs enhance the rights of women with mental disabilities? And we know that accommodation is the cornerstone of human rights law and the cornerstone of equality. And my concern is, our concern is that um, what we'll hear from the Canadian government is we are fulfilling our obligation to accommodate because we can prove it. Here's all the stuff we've done. But I would say to the Human Rights Commission, think broadly, think deeply, really dig into this issue. Don't look at it superficially. Part of finding an, an effective accommodation solution is to evaluate a variety of accommodation solutions. And I would say to you that there is more than just providing accommodation internally. We don't think that works. So we would ask you to consider accommodation solutions that look at other alternatives beyond the um, federal system. That doesn't mean to say that the federal government can't be held accountable for providing those alternatives and providing resources for those alternatives. We certainly think that that is, um, is a must. But we're saying to you, don't get locked into a very narrow conception of accommodation. Let's look at it in its fullest sense in the way that it was identified in or described and defined in the Muron case and in the uh, Grismer case. It really has to be about 
ensuring equality of results and not just accommodating women with mental disabilities on the margins of society. So in closing, I would just say that I and reiterate what many of my colleagues have said uh, to the Human Rights Commission. This is a, a, a systemic um, issue that requires not just the simple asking of questions, it needs an, a, an analysis. And I would say in the case of, of people, of women with mental disabilities, please use a rights lens. Don't focus on the antiquated, historically discriminatory medical model. It's not just about providing programs, locking women up, uh, protecting them for their own good. It's about how do we empower them, how do we enhance their opportunity to exercise their rights and to be equal citizens of our society. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else from Dawn who would like to speak? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne.